Hello and welcome to The Hearing, our music review show here on this channel. I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album from 1985, So Red the Rose by Arcadia. Concluding our uh, impromptu Duran Duran side project two-parter. <laughs> I'm probably the most prepared for this review than almost any other album we've ever done, actually. <laughs> It's which is good because I was well last year week well yeah last week was probably my most prepared because I know that album called it it felt like a long time ago it could have been last year <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get to the, the preparation for, uh, in a bit um, Arcadia were a new wave British group formed in 1985 by Simon Le Bon Nick Rhodes and Roger Taylor not the guy from Queen um, no relation uh, of Duran Duran oh, it's actually a double no relation in this case because. <laughs> The, the two Taylors in Duran Duran and also Roger Taylor from Queen. Uh, I just love working the Animaniacs reference in as much as possible, okay? Um, from, of Duran Duran as a side project during a break in the band schedule. Say, you know, last verse, same as the first. Um, Drummer Roger Taylor appeared in only a few band photographs and none of the music videos and stated he was only to be involved in the recording side of the project. He also had a minor involvement with Power Station. Um, and the band was reportedly inspired by the Nicholas Poussin painting Et in Arcadia Ego. And I've checked multiple sources. That actually is the correct pronunciation. Um, also known as the Arcadian Shepherds. Um, so Red the Rose is Arcadia's only album. It was released on November 18th, <clears throat> almost the anniversary of it, um, on, in 1985 by Paul Parlophone Records in the UK and Capital EMI in the US. It was produced by Andy Sadkin and Arcadia and features Simon Le Bon on vocals, Nick Rhodes on keyboards, Roger Taylor on drums, with additional musicians Mark Egan on bass, who in my opinion is the real star of the album, um, Masami Tsuchiya on guitar and violin, Carlos Alomar and David Gilmore on guitar, Sting on additional vocals, Grace Jones on additional vocals, Herbie Hancock on additional keyboards, uh, Andy McKay on um, saxophone, Steve Jordan on additional drums. Talk about, you know, amazing session players here. Well, yeah. Um, David Van Tegum, Manu Cache, uh, Raphael De Jesus on additional percussion, Wendell Jr. on drum programming, Jean-Claude Dubois on harp, and Pierre Defay on violin. Um, yeah, the the, sesh, the the additional musicians on this play, album are insane. Um, reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnandscotto.com, that's John A-N-D, Scotto, you'll find links to Sarah the Rose on Spotify and YouTube if you'd like to follow along. On to track one, Election Day. This was the big single. And I would actually pick this as the strongest track of the okay. album, actually. Hmm. Um and really, I, I think the single edit's better. Um, it just packs more of a punch. Mm. Although the album version, he does this little Morrison nod where he does the "so restless indeed." That's not a single version. <laughs> I thought no, I thought I, I'd always heard that. <laughs> That's cut out. Of it. Or at least the single. Uh, there's there's like a million and one different versions of the goddamn song, actually. Because yeah, I know the song pretty well. This is the one song I well, one of two songs I'd heard before, and the one I know pretty well. Um, and I'd always heard that. So restless indeed. It's probably my favorite part of the song. Because it's like uh, I'm thinking of like Soft Parade, where it's like you know, the monk brought lunch and like yeah, he brought a little. Mm. <laughs> Because, I mean, obviously Morrison was a huge influence on, on Le bon. But I just love the beginning. The bass starts the groove, and the song just kind of settles into that groove. And then there's this nice, quick, sliding, har ascending harmonic. I'm going to be going on about Mark Egan. Um, Mark Egan is a fretless bassist who typically plays jazz, one of the best in the world. And they got him for this pop album. I, I totally agree with you that he is the star of this album mm -hmm. without a doubt the bass playing is like the thing that it, from beginning to end i i can't say a bad thing about um there's also a lot more guitar on this song than i remember and this is one i listen to pretty regularly but i didn't notice all the guitar until i was reviewing it um, I, yeah there's i mean th that's what's great about this song is that it does have everything packed into it mm -hmm. like this whole jazzy i mean mo 
goth Motown thing mm-hmm. that they're doing it's, here. It's definitely one of my favorites, just not my absolute favorite. Um, I think the sax riff after the chorus is a little beyond Thunderdome. I was picturing the shirtless guy. <laughs> I remember, it's a couple of years before Beyond Thunderdome. Oh, okay. Um, and it wasn't him. It was, I know yeah. Andy McKay has done a ton of things. I just couldn't play some. Um, <laughs> and I always thought the spoken part um, during the break was Eartha Kitt. Turns out it was Grace Jones. Yeah. And it, it kind of, it's a, a problem with the album is they bring in this great, you know, list of people mm-hmm. and they just kind of, they don't use them, you well, know. They use them sparingly, which I think is kind of a nice touch. They None of, none of the guest stars really steals focus. Like, um, contrast this to the Power Station album that we did last episode. Mm-hmm. That album was exuberant. Everything was turned up to 11. Yeah. And it, there was nobody that was just, like, sitting in the back. Whereas this, they brought in all of these people, and you're kind of like, oh, wait a minute, was that was that Grace Jones? <laughs> well, because they happened to be in the studio one day, and they said, you know, could you come by and do a thing for like five minutes? <laughs> Was that even five minutes? Was she? Did she even well, take I mean, her she coat was, off to do no, that? No, I mean saying she was actually in the booth for like a full five <laughs> minutes to do the whole thing, um, retake and everything. Um, I still have no idea what she was saying. And that's the other thing too. I mean, at least like it just you know sounds and byways and <laughs> so just, they just had her like saying random words and then you know left. I mean, the mm-hmm. flaming lips did something like that with Karen O where. They just like I asked her to make animal noises. Or <laughs> My only criticism: I think the ending sax solo goes on a little too long, and is very very eighties. Oh, of course. Wow, this is the same year as Power Station. Well, yes. Both of these are quite just drags on a bit for me. And uh, and again, the, the single version's better. Because it it, it doesn't it cuts drag. off a lot of ending. It's tighter, yeah. and it, it yeah, it's like a minute shorter. I think mm. probably all cut from the end. Because I know that beginning was in the single version. Like, I take, think for, like takes a minute a to little, find the groove. It's a little shorter. Like mm. everything is just a little shorter in the mm. single version. And I think that's you know you need to edit <laughs> sometimes. You know, I I think one of the things they wanted to do they wanted to be a prog band like i I have that note later but i'll I'll say it now this this album could have been a lot more interesting if they weren't bogged down by pop star expectations right like even when they were doing seven and the ragged tiger before this they they were toying with the idea of doing like a big epic at the end of that album Uh and it somehow didn't work out and they just did this short kind of thing and and kind of went out with the piffle <laughs> <laughs> but but the gloves should have been off here you know yeah. and they weren't on to track two keep me in the dark now this is my pick for the weakest it's just a very typical 80s ballad you know and i think the sad thing about this is the intro is really interesting oh yeah like, it sounds like we're getting into, like, some shit that was like, oh, my God, what what are we about to get into? The really nice kick sound, and Rhodes is playing these kind of weird, sound, random sounds over the top of everything. Right. Well, he does a lot of random sounds, but this is more melodic sounds, <laughs> you know, random sounds. Yeah. <laughs> and it sounds like he, it's really going to be like... <sighs> Is this going to be like a Depeche Mode, like mm-hmm. something way beyond its years, kind of the ministry even? And uh, then it just kind of settles down into a pretty dull song. <laughs> it's like, what? Why did you guys do that? And, and we were talking about this off air last time, um, how uh, you were saying that Nick Rhodes has won all these best keyboardist of the year awards in different magazines and such. And... Well, they did something. I've seen something where they had like a list of all the greatest keyboards. Oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah keyboard players of all time yeah. and when they put him on it i was kind of like really <laughs> well and that's one some distinction i wanted to bring up um he, he's not necessarily a great keyboard player but he's a great synthesis yeah he comes that, that up with it. really interesting things to do with a synthesizer that that is exactly it uh, i mean 
everything. And sometimes they they kind of overuse some of the things he does, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, just a little bit more on this track. Um, I do like how tight the rhythm section is. Um, and there's this kind of off kilter echoey synth string sound that get, goes from the between the verses into the second verse that I really liked. Um, and the random solo sound solo is kind of fun. There's an instrumental break. That's just these random noises. I forget what, you know, my, my old notes that I lost mm -hmm. had, which I think I'd figured out which song Herbie Hancock was playing on. Oh, I had that listed. I just didn't mention it. Um, I can't remember which Grace one. Grace Jones, of course, election day. Um, Sting is on uh, the promise. Well, that, that one, of course, we know. But yeah. where was Herbie Hancock? Also on the promise. Oh, he's on the pro okay. And and Steve oh, right, Jordan plays right. on Lady Ice. All right, I now I'm remembering that little keyboard riff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, on to track three. Goodbye is forever. This is another one I kind of was familiar with. I've been listening to it recently, um, just to kind of check more of the album out, even before we decide to review a, it. I thought this was a Duran Duran song. This <laughs> is very Duran Duran. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of the tragedy of this album, is that it, it's quite pointless what they've done here. <laughs> well, this is a Duran Duran song that's a bit elevated for me because there's a guitar riff on the left side that I'm sure is Carlos Alomar. Um, I thought Carlos Alomar was on the flame, actually. No, he's, I could he just has additional guitar for him. It doesn't list a particular okay. song. But uh, for those who don't know, Carlos Alomar played with Bowie for several years. Um, right. And there's a riff on the left side that is very Bowie. Okay. Uh, and the, But like the problem with this song, though, is the melody, the keyboards even, it's Wild Boys again. Like, yeah, I can hear it. Wild Boys and made a ballad out of it. So, I mean, so I say it's the album is pointless was that they were off on their own. They could have done anything. They could have, you know, really stretched. And, and I mean, the point of doing a different band is that you don't have the pop expectation. Right. Well, expectation. but you still do, you know, I, I have this kind of, I have a bit of head cannon here. Right? I have this, I can imagine Nick Rhodes playing with these interesting sounds and wanting to go completely artistic and, and LeBond just walking in and saying, well, we still need to sell the damn thing. But they didn't, because they could just come back and do Duran Duran yeah. in, in like another year or two. But they still had a record company breathing down their neck saying, you're Duran Duran, you need to sell those kind of numbers. And they should have just made another Duran Duran album, though. Mm. Well, they were on hiatus. Right. So this was just a bonus album. This mm -hmm. was an album to play on and do... Thing. I mean, that's the yeah, point but of. The, but the not record doing company was still album. paying for the session time and probably paying all the session players, so they still wanted to make money. Yeah, but think of how much money they had already made uh, over the three years. They had they had the the you know leeway mm -hmm. to do this, and if they're really concerned about selling albums, you just make another Duran Duran album. Well, I mean, it's it's the David Gilmore Pink Floyd thing, mm -hmm. you know they they. Momentary Lapse of Reason was supposed to have been a solo album, and the record company said, right. you realize how many more copies you'll sell if right. this, if you call yourself Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. so but the I, point I don't know. It, it's this... Just, this was 85, you know, the midst of the 80s when music stopped being artistic, when the music industry stopped being artistic. Um, I, I just have a feeling it was record company executives saying, you still need to sell, you still need, need to make a pop album. I, I think the point of this, though, was to make an album, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to stretch. And I think they, they suffered as a band because they didn't do that. I think at least somebody wanted to. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that on Rhodes because he's, he's the keyboard player. You think, um, yeah, I would think so too. But, you know, there were restrictions. That's, that's what they, I get from they, this. Um, and, and back to the song Goodbyes Forever. It yeah. is a straight-up pop song. It's elevated a little bit for me for the rhythm guitar, which I'm pretty sure is Carlos Almar, um, one of the best rhythm players of all time. Oh, definitely. On to track four, The Flame, and no, Cheap Trick did not cover this. Um, the, Cheap Trick, <laughs> the Cheap Trick song came out in 88. Yeah, there's a few songs that, that have yeah, I'll get to the other one songs later. that come later. Um, um, yeah, there's a this... definite Bowie nod. Oh, at the okay, beginning. I didn't think I caught that one. Um, well, think about it. It begins with, like, I think it's Japanese. Oh, it's, it's Spanish, I think. And then it's like it's it's pretty much like scary monsters. Okay, yeah, I can I get that now. We have some weird percussion and Spanish vocal. 
only the problem is it's like it's like the uh let's dance bowie performing <laughs> it's no game instead of the scary monsters bowie uh-huh. he um, does he even does some bowie mannerisms in his vocals when he does that lower voice of the song <laughs> of course mark egan saves it again great bass sounding groove um well bond's vocals do sound a little bit like a dracula impression to me <laughs> I want to suck your blood, that sort of thing. It kind of sounds like he's doing that. Um, it is nice to hear a guitar solo. Although Rhodes overshadows it a bit. Yeah. Now, this is where the album gets interesting for me. Because, you know, I, I kind of like Goodbyes Forever, but that, those, th- those three in a row were kind of, eh. They were very Duran Duran. Yeah. We get to track five, the, not the missing, just missing. Um, track five, missing. Nice to hear some piano. Yeah. And I kind of like this chaotic sort of Middle Eastern opening. And I thought like everybody who does that sort of thing in the 80s, a groove was going to kick in and you're going to get drums and it was going to be a pop song. But they kept it soft. Yeah. Like the the keyboards actually are very similar to what he used on Seventh Stranger and, uh, Mm -hmm. and Seven and the Ragged Tiger. And, um, a lot of, this feels like they're really going after a Peter Gabriel, yeah, I can hear that. you know, yeah. San Jacinto and, mm-hmm. and lead a normal life vibe where it, even like the next song, Rose Arcana is mm-hmm. like the same kind of yeah. thing where it's just an interlude. Right. So uh-huh. both of these are, have a very, a Peter Gabriel feel. Right. I would have loved if they have actually expanded on this and just did a longer. <laughs> this is my favorite because it was just yeah. such a surprise. Um, love the harmonized fretless um, and how they kind of play with the timing throughout. There is no set rhythm throughout yeah. the song. Love the little soprano sax touches. Um, this was a little bit before Kenny G ruined the instrument for everyone. <laughs> Too much of a good thing. <laughs> On to track six, Rogue's Arcana. It's an instrumental. Yeah. I was not expecting an instrumental. Well, they did instrumentals as Duran Duran. See, I only know the, even to, to, to today, I know the singles from Duran Duran. I really need to delve into an album. But I, it was like, I didn't know someone could do that even. It was kind of like, wait a minute, you can do a song? <laughs> like, it was the first time <laughs> I heard an instrumental was, was one of those early Duran Duran albums. Like, <laughs> I think it was... It was Tel Aviv, where they okay. just had like an opera singer in the background. It was, you know, uh, they did a lot. They were very prog influenced. Uh, this is okay, so instrumental. I love this sort of high tongue drum sounding synth on the right in the beginning. Um, and it's really just Rhodes, you know, just messing around with his synthesizer. Taylor keeping this very simple beat. And Mark Egan just mawing all over the place. Um for those who don't know, mawing is a fretless bass technique, and that is the technical term, <laughs> um, where you, you press very just enough to get a solid note, and you get a nice amount of buzz. And it's this very, um, kind, of like, kind of sounds like a wah-wah pedal, but on a fretless. Yeah, um, I definitely think both of these were, were bright parts of the, the oh, album. Yeah. On to track seven, The Promise, and no, this was not covered by When in Rome. You forgot about that one, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That was also released in 88, the one in Rome song. I was referring to the missing ministry from okay. like a couple of years after this. All right, all right. <laughs> and uh, wow, the patron love, saint of underusing your... your, your, uh, your love the lead players. guitar sound on this because I'm yeah. pretty sure it was Gilmore. Of course it was. But it, it just disappears too quickly, you well, know? No, it's throughout the song. Uh, you, you really notice at the beginning, but he does play throughout the song. It, right, I know he does, but they've got it so low in the mix. It's like, yeah. it's like you invited Mozart over <laughs> it, to the studio, but you just have him play a tuba like in the next room. It's just <laughs> like, what doesn't make any sense, man. Mm. And again, it's like the same keyboards they use on like Tiger Tiger. And, <laughs> See, you yeah. came into this knowing Duran Duran really well, so it's well, yeah, be a different experience for you. It was part of my preparation of this actually because I hadn't listened to Seven and the Ragged Tiger in a long time. Mm. And I, I wound up listening to it a couple times because, well, we had this extra week in between. Right. So, and then going back to listen to Power Station to keep compare the two. And uh, yeah, the, the, he's reusing a lot of keyboards in this album that he just used in Duran Duran like a year or two earlier. 
that, that that's interesting because you spent the extra time like pre prepping for this review by listening to render in i listened to this once last week or last wednesday when we were supposed to record and then listened to it again today um to refresh my memory and kind of make sure my no i understood my notes in the interim i listened to a lot of punch brothers and saint vincent now I'm sure I had the better experience. Yours was, you were probably more <laughs> responsible. Oddly, the more responsible of the two of us. Um, but I, I love how Egan plays ahead of the beat on this one. Um, this is another one of my favorites. Um, great groove. Um, this, this is where I realized the second half of the album is much m more interesting. Um, this And this really leans into their prog year side. And yeah, this they, this could have been a, a prog mm -hmm. epic, I think. This is where I have the notes about the pop star expectations. Um, um, also, I kind of like that Sting doesn't really stand out too much. I mean, yeah, they've they've pretty much had everybody else <laughs> aside. I, I, honestly, you know what they should have done? I think Rhodes and Lebon should have split and done albums of their own at this point. Oh yeah. I if I'm right about, you know, Rhodes' tendencies, um I would love to hear a solo album of his just with the gloves off. Could you imagine if it was just Rhodes and Gilmore doing an album together like Gilmore is his lead singer? I don't know if that's singer. I mean, he's okay, Why not? but he can find better singers. Gilmore on lead guitar, fuck yeah. Um I they could find the, a better singer. The weakness of Gilmore and Pink Floyd was he—he he wasn't a good lyricist, but he I mean was, he was—he was a passable singer. But uh, I mean nothing special. The, well, the way he emoted, I think he—he he did. I think about it. He was the lead singer on like Dark Side and and I mean mm. the classic Floyd albums. Right. And and Waters was kind of jealous and wanted to be more of the lead guy himself, but. It was clear Gilmore had the better singing voice. Well, Gilmore's got the better technical voice. Waters is has the more interesting voice. I always yeah, say. yeah. It's like Lennon and McCartney. McCartney's got the better technical voice, or you know, ha he still has. Lennon or had the more interesting voice. Or he could have done something with Sting and Gilmore as his singers. And yeah, just that would have been better. Um, <laughs> just have Gilmore play guitar, have Sting sing and play bass, and you know, the two voices would have gone very well together. And, and but here. But, hmm. Here they're kind of kept really separately. <laughs> but I like that Sting doesn't stand out because getting back to the promise, um, his because he can overshadow other a, a track very easily. True, that's very true. He just has one of those amazing attention grabbing voices that can just completely still focus, especially compared to Simon Le Bon. Nothing against him; he's he's a passable singer. Simon uh, Le Bon has a good voice. He's not Sting. again. I think he's a good singer, but I, I just don't, I think his lyricist. His, 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 well, yeah. Where is well, lyricist? I'm not, not going to go into Simon Le Bon's lyrics, but you know, <laughs> just comparing their voices, I have no problem with Simon Le Bon's voice. He's good, but you, you know? put him next to Sting, you don't want to give you don't want to bring Sting too high high up in the mix because he's just going to eat him for lunch. I was like, let me get this straight. The girl's name is Rio, <laughs> and yet you're comparing her to the Rio Grande. You know what? A, you know what a metaphor is, Simon. <laughs> he was better than Joe Elliott. <laughs> okay, yeah, true. <laughs> anyway, I do like the bass groove during the guitar solo. He's played something yes. really interesting there. Um, I think the instrumental break goes on a little too long. Um, gets a little meandering. Um, Egan just owns this track for me, which I yeah. think is why it's one of my favorite. He he really stands out. Um, We've had two great bass players two weeks in a row. I love that. Um, I think the, as I'm calling it, Jan Hammer ending goes on a bit too long. <laughs> it, it just gets very of its time. I also missed Mark Egan at the end. On to track eight, El Diablo. Opening with a solo violin, which is very interesting. I, this is my weakest. In fact, okay. I downright hate this track. <laughs> wow. I don't know how I feel about the, the second track. My, my work is my weakest. Um, it gets into this very cliche groove after that. Um, though I, I do like the kind of pan flute synth and the bass sound. No, no. <laughs> no you don't like the pan flute? No. I was like, why, 
why why are you doing this i mean i've heard it similar keyboard sounds used earlier in in like by other artists at an earlier date but at this point no no zamfir was a thing at this point <laughs> you do not fucking use the pan flute okay that's maybe why i liked it because i'd forgotten all about that it was just a nice change for me. Um, and then just the the cheesy, you know... It's a very predictable pop song, I think. Spanish e- language, the Spanish guitar. Yeah. It, was, it was almost an illegal alien level of cringiness. <laughs> that was just like... Oof. Egan elevates it for me. I, I think the classical course, guitar yeah. in the bridge was a nice surprise. Um, no, no, it wasn't. Because you knew there was going to be some Spanish guitar out of the fucking Spanish language. Okay, fair no, point, fair point. No. Um, it's a very typical pop song with what I think is some interesting production, Egan killing it again, and there's some nice sound effects at the end. On to the final track, Lady Ice, track nine. Starts off with some sound effects that are very fun. Um, beginning goes on a very, I won't say too long, because I enjoyed it. Um, it's, a yeah. little, it's like well over a minute. It kind of turns into a tone poem. I, I was thinking it was another instrumental. Right, right. I was kind of hoping it was actually, but um, it, it's got like it's a very dual, you know, effect here, where Rhodes has some really cheesy keyboards, but he has some really good moody keyboards mm-hmm. too, at the same time. And like the power station, they end on a haunting ballad. <laughs> um, I, I I think the verse melody is a very Beatles-ish. Um, yeah. Actually, the song was kind of very Beatles-ish to me, melodically and, and kind of harmonically, even though it was moody. Um, Sometimes I was wondering, is he saying Lady Eyes or Lady Ice? Ice. <laughs> I know. Technically in the title. Um, I know. I, I do like the sometimes, low... Sometimes it sounded like he was saying Lady yeah, Eyes. Um, yeah. um, like, like the low synth string riff that comes in here and there. Um, Egan's just mauling the hell out of it again. Yeah. Um, love it when the groove kicks in, but it stays dark and moody. It doesn't suddenly become a happy song because the drums kicked in. Um, another fa- is of course another favorite of mine. Um, nice kind of I sax. Like, I would like to have seen it gone a little, you know, in a more epic nature mm. in this one. But a nice sax slash synth solo. They kind of yeah. bleed into each other. You can't really tell where they switch off. Um, and it gets kind of ni- nicely atonal during the synth part. Um, and I think I've realized I actually may like saxophone now after the last two. <laughs> I've never been a fan, and but I like the sax on these two albums. Well, New York um, City is all right if you like saxophones. Um, and, you know, just my note, again, like I said earlier, I've been as Rose is just a great synthesis. He comes up with some very interesting sounds. I've been playing with one of my soft synths lately. Oh, it's yeah? Soft, it's, well, soft synth is a computer, is a soft synth on a computer. So I play it with a key, key, computer keyboard. Um, I've been having a lot of fun just tweaking things and t- creating interesting sounds. Um, so I, I could definitely get Rhodes' interest in that. Um, couldn't help thinking back to, I think, it, um, it, I know it was, um, Gary Newman. Oh, right. Was saying he was a rock guitar player before yeah. Cars. <laughs> he went in the studio to make Cars, and that's why that riff sounds very guitar, because it was written on a guitar. It's why the, that's why the Fear Factory version works because it that's what how it was written to be played. Um, that makes sense. But then in the studio, he discovered a synthesizer, and just fell in love because <laughs> it could make all of these sounds. Yeah. Um, just one last note on uh, Lady Ice. I just like the cold stop. Yeah. It was a nice um, way to end it. Yeah, it was a nice bass harmonic. Um, so, do you recommend it? I would not. I think really? when your best track. It is the single edits better? <laughs> I think, I think I I would pass on this one. I would recommend it mostly for the second half. Oh, Election Day is good. The next few are kind of forgettable, but I think the second half is really strong. I'd find other work from that bass player. And, oh, Mark, uh, yeah, look, Mark Egan, E G A N. Look him up. He's a, he's a genius. Yeah, I'd go for that. Like I said, I think they should have split. They they were just too in the Duran Duran bubble, and and like they they needed to stretch more, you know, mm-hmm. and utilize the people that that were coming in to play with them, you know. We shouldn't have to be like, hey, was Carlos Salomar on this track or this track, or you know, was Herbie Hancock on this track or this track? No, I mean, 
it's kind of they they were kind of wasted opportunities. Mm. All right, that's it for Sir Red Rose. Until next time, we'll be reviewing The Fugitive by Tony Banks. Oh, wow. Mm. <laughs> or synth pop. Always remember, oh, yeah. don't forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. <laughs>